we thought we would have a talk about Rubicon One, the album that we've just released. Um, listen to some of the tracks and just talk about how we approached it. And hopefully that will be of some interest. And um, I'll hand over to Kevin. We recorded the album in August of 2018 at my studio in Massachusetts over a, as I recall, two-day period. Does that sound right? Yeah. And the sessions went so well that we ended up with material for two full albums. So the first one is Rubicon One that we're releasing now. And then later in 2021 or early 2022, we will release Rubicon Two, which is the second set of pieces from the same recording sessions. Uh, the first piece we're going to discuss is Particle Horizon. I'd point out that this piece, I think, is the longest piece we've ever recorded, clocking in at over 19 and a half minutes. Yeah, it was, it was a, for me, it was, it was the first time that that orchestral approach really took on this kind of full formed approach i we've tried we have used that that approach a little bit in some of our past recordings but this is the first time i felt it really took on a kind of life of its own and really became a a uh, yeah more of a a full orchestral piece almost you could say in how it changed and, and, and evolved and so forth so tell me about how you approached playing over the sort of orchestral sounding soundscapes that I was making. I was using my 17 string hybrid extended classical on this track and I was really just reacting to what you were doing. I wasn't, I wasn't really putting a lot of conscious thought into what I wanted to do. I was just reacting to what I was hearing coming from you and that really determined what I was playing and, and what I was not playing. Yeah. And in a kind of slower sense, I was doing the same. It's slower, I mean, by the way I'm creating those textures is not something that I can change just, well, I can change it quickly, but it's more of an evolving approach rather than something where I suddenly change to something else, although I do do that on occasion. And so in a sense, I was just gradually changing it as what you played evolved. 
and uh, yeah, I, I really found it interesting how what you were doing and the harmonic progression of harmonic textures that you were creating and exploring kind of re changed the context of what I was doing in really interesting ways. And then of course that made me think, oh, okay, now maybe this could move over to, to here because of what's, what's just happened there and so forth. Right. It's also noteworthy to point out that while you're, you're playing guitar on this, there's no guitar sounds or sounds really identifiable as guitar on here. So you're essentially orchestrating or triggering everything with a guitar, even though the end result is not a guitar-like sound. Yeah. I mean, you can occasionally hear guitar notes kind of off in the background that I bring in occasionally, but you're right, almost the whole time I'm playing all those notes, but I'm playing them with the guitar sound off and it's feeding those notes into uh, a very complex set of um, electronics, basically. Um, it's all software, but nonetheless, it's, it's, that's the concept of it. No actual synthesizers involved, although it sounds like a big synth soundscape. There isn't. It's all based on guitar, process guitar sounds. But the guitar sounds are coming off your MIDI hex pickup, right? Yeah, but um, that MIDI hex pickup is not, it's actually not a MIDI pickup. It's, it's just a, an audio pickup like any other guitar pickup, except that it has six separate pickups, one for each string, but they are in fact just a magnetic pickup like, like any other guitar pickup, and the sound that comes out is just a, a clean guitar sound, but it's separated out, each string is separate, and that allows um, processing, which I wasn't actually using. The sound going into the laptop where all that was happening was a normal guitar signal. Um, yeah. So you can assign different different sound qualities per string, right? So each string can trigger something else. I can do that if I'm using the VG88 hardware. Uh, but to be honest, I, I never really do that, but you can. Okay, so you were not, weren't doing it on this piece, in other words? No, I never really do do that. Um, by the time it gets into the laptop, it's just coming out of a stereo out from the VG88. And it's just one of my normal guitar patches coming out of there directly into the laptop and all the processes processing is happening to a stereo audio file that comes in, not file signal that comes in interesting that that piece turned out to be so long i think we'd even during post production we'd even talked about maybe breaking it into two or three smaller pieces but i felt like it was just such a complete singular composition that i didn't I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to break it up. I just loved how it all held together and just carried you through completely to the end. And by the end, in my opinion, it doesn't feel like it's been 19 and a half minutes, right? Yeah, not to me. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, it does seem to kind of have a structure that evolves in a, in a way that's, for me anyway, like quite satisfying and... Um, tells a story which, yeah, I felt worked well as a single piece. So this one's called The Lensing, and Kevin plays piano on this, uh, and I play guitar without, like, lots of electronics and so forth. Um, what I like about this one is the atmosphere that managed, we managed to, to get into um, which I think a lot of which comes from the piano. Um, and it just seems to really go into this atmosphere, this very strong kind of mood or atmosphere, which to me is almost like a, a visual place I can see almost um, that has a, yeah, almost activities going on in it, which is what the music is, that almost people this, this place. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how it, how it feels for me, and, and therefore it's almost like characters interacting in this, in this place for me. Um, yeah. How, how does it strike you? For me, this was a really dynamic piece. I had some things in mind that I wanted to do before we rolled tape, so I had a, I had a kind of a direction in mind for it, but after 
it got started, I felt like it took off in its own direction. And it's such a dynamic piece with a lot of pull and movement. Um, I think it goes through a lot of emotional territory, really. And it another again, it's another kind of a longish piece at almost 11 minutes. But I think there are sections in there that, that take on a almost like a classical music kind of density, like you might get in a Schoenberg string quartet or something, that kind of density of interweaving lines, which I, I think turned out really well. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's one of those pieces where our mutual um, interest in that kind of music, which we both have a very strong interest in all that kind of music, um, kind of comes into play and, and has an influence in a kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not necessarily something that guides us, I don't think, it's just a reference and a way of a, 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 a context within which we can create something, I guess you could say. Or that, ha that, yeah, sometimes, yeah, appears out of nowhere. So let's start somewhere in the middle here, like around about the two minute, bit after the two minute mark, and you have a, have a bit of a listen. Yeah, that gets into some really intense areas there. It starts out in that section in sort of a almost a contrapuntal way where there's two clear lines occurring, and pretty soon that sort of mutates into multiple lines, and by the end of that passage, I've gotten very harmonically dense, and what you're playing has gotten very intense. Um, again, just a very, very strongly dense piece of music. When I had started that piece and the, the things that I had in mind for it were really sort of a jumping off point. Once I had kind of started the piece in that direction, it took on a life of its own. And, and the, the thing that I had preconceived became sort of a 
just a beginning point instead of an overarching total concept for that whole piece. But I really, really love what you're playing on that piece. It's really strong. It's really intense. Really nicely done. Thanks. Uh, I mean, what you're playing is also, uh, yeah, really strong and and working. I think yes, for me, it's very much two sides of the same coin in a piece of this like this. We're kind of playing back and forth in a sense that each of the lines that each of us does kind of is the other side of the coin or the other. That's the way I kind of hear it. Hmm. Um, and one wouldn't really happen with the, without the other. Like they're completely kind of dependent on each other in terms of why, what happens when and how and the intensity and everything is all to me um, yeah, very linked together. Um, but yeah, I agree. That's a place where it really um, turned into something which to me, yeah, it's, 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 it's very satisfying in terms of the fact that it, it created something that I kind of heard for a long time in a sense, in not those exact notes, but that type of um, line, those kinds of lines, that kind of intensity, that kind of mood, all those kinds of things, and those types of harmonic changes and progressions and all of that, uh, I've kind of had in my mind for a long time, and it's it's really nice and quite satisfying to have it happen. Um, and um, yeah, it's one, it's, it's one of those occasions that to me really points out when you, how can I explain it? You just lose that sense of where you are and who you are and you're just so absorbed in the, the music that the music really is just taking a life of its own and it, Absolutely. to me at least, doesn't feel like it's got anything to do with me. It's just, it's just happening and I'm really just, all I am is just allowing it to kind of come out or appear. Um, don't really know what's going to happen next. Um, you kind of feel what it should come next and you just execute that as best you can and kind of allow it to happen. Um, and that's, yeah, for me, it's an example of that was just really in full kind of flow for quite a period of time. I could hear when we were recording this, I could hear where it was going. And all I wanted to do was just stay out of its way and just let that happen organically. And I, and I really think it did. Um, there are places in this piece that to me are reminiscent of the harmonic effects found in Alban Berg's 1935 Violin Concerto. If you're familiar with that piece, you know that the, the harmonic structures in that piece sound, to me, extremely three-dimensional. Like, I, I, when I hear it, I don't imagine it being written on manuscript paper. I envision it being written on different layers of glass superimposed over each other because it just sounds like it's lifting off the page, like you couldn't contain those harmonics on a single flat piece of paper. Mm. And every time I hear it, I'm just knocked over by that. Not that the harmonic structure of this piece sounds anything like Berg, but it has that kind of three-dimensional harmonic sound um, texture to me. And I really like that. Yeah. And I wasn't aiming for that when we recorded it. I just, when we heard the rough mixes later, I started to sort of key, on, key in on that and realize that's, that's what had transpired. That's interesting. I can really hear what you mean about the three-dimensional aspect of it. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that before, but yeah. Yeah, for those of you listening, if you, if you don't know the Alban Berg Violin Concerto, it is a tremendous piece of music, and I recommend you check it out. Okay, so this one's called Event Horizon, and this one was another one where I was creating orchestral textures in a sense, um, using electronics and there's not a lot of the clean guitar or the, you know, the normal guitar signal, although you can hear it in places, um, sometimes coming, emerging out of what I've made, which is a kind of, I think of it as like a, a sea or an ocean of, of undulating and moving sound. And to me, that was a kind of a concept I had 
before we started the piece, we were thinking about, well, what should we play next? And I just had this idea of creating something like that. And let's give it a try and see what happens. Um, so I kind of had the idea of making a kind of ocean, a moving, undulating ocean of of sound that would rise up and down and sometimes even kind of consume what you were playing, Kevin, and then come back down again and reveal it like an ocean would with a boat or something like that. Um, and um, so, yeah, so it has an orchestral aspect to the, to the actual harmonic content, but then there's a lot of sort of sound design aspect to how it moves and changes and the texture changes and all of that. Um, yeah, so for me, it was a kind of an interesting um, and, and different kind of con concept to, than anything we'd really tried before from that perspective, from my perspective. Um, and I thought what you played was just really amazing and absolutely, um, it was really nice for me to kind of, despite the fact that sometimes what I'm doing does rise up and overwhelm what you're doing slightly at times, it was nice to sit back for a whole piece and just let you play in a sense um, and yeah, what you did was just amazing, beyond amazing from my perspective. Well, thank you. And so, yeah, it was nice to kind of, to interact in a way, in a really different way than, than usual. I can't really take credit for anything I played because I feel like, again, I was just reacting to what you were creating in the moment, but thank you for saying so. You made a, a comment a second ago that, that this was different than anything we had previously done, which I think is a, a valid point, but I think that statement kind of applies to most, if not everything on this record. I think this is just on a different level than anything we've previously done. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. Um, and I don't think I quite realized that when we'd recorded it. I, I, knew, I knew that it was, there was a lot of strong material there and that it had all worked. Um, and I knew there was quite a, it felt a bit different, but I didn't realize just like you said, just quite how different it was and how much each track is kind of broken different ground for us from what we'd done previously. Right. So yeah, that was kind of a surprise, but a nice one. So you play the opening? Yeah. And then maybe what we'll do is talk a bit and then jump to a, a bit later on. Great, okay.
Okay, so um, yeah, I realized that I did start actually playing there a little bit towards the end, just kind of accompanying you. But for the most part, I, I, I stayed in the background and created soundscapes, but actually never forgotten that in, the, in that place there, I kind of pulled the soundscapes back and came forward with a clean guitar sound, but then the soundscapes come back in after that again. Right. Um, so the instrument I'm using on that track is the 15 string classical, which is a really unusual voice in that it's an extended range classical guitar, a double course, and each course is tuned in unison, except for the low three bass courses, which are singles. And obviously classical guitars are usually just six strings, six single strings, but this is closer kind of in lute territory in that it has double courses tuned in unisons, yet it's in the classical tuning, so it just brings a color and a texture that just uh, sort of can't be had any other way. And I think it's a really, really special voice in the guitar world. And I just love it. When I first got it, I thought it might be something that I used once in a while, but it's really become a go-to instrument in, in many cases. And I end up using it a lot more than I thought I would just because it's just so beautiful, to me anyway. And I think it works well on this piece with what you're doing. It tends to have a more delicate voice than like the contra guitars, for example. And that makes such a great contrast to those sort of oceanic soundscapes that you're producing against it. I really like that. Yeah, me too. The, the, the voice of your guitar on this, uh, well, not everything sounds really great, but on this one, I agree, it really sounds, there's something about the, the slightly more delicate nature of it that really works against the kind of hugeness of the, of the soundscape. And uh, yeah, it's an, it's an amazing voice, actually. I, I remember when you first got that instrument, thinking it sounded really amazing, and then you've just really taken it from there and, and moved it into its own, like even more and more, um, the more you've used it. Thank you. It's very nice of you to say. So I guess I could talk a bit about what I'm doing there, uh, processing-wise. I haven't talked that much uh, about what I've been doing, but I, on this record, I, I used a lot of new processing ideas and techniques that I've been working on for quite a long time and developing gradually over time, but, but I added a lot more into it this time um, that I've been developing. Um, and technology has just allowed things to be possible. I guess I've been trying to push at the boundaries of what technology can do sound-wise since, you know, I started in a sense. And certainly once computers came along, I really started going that way even further. And, and in recent years, it's become possible to do an awful lot more because computer speeds have allowed more and more innovative software to come out and which have opened up a lot more options. And yeah, it's, it's allowed me to kind of develop things which I've had in my imagination for a long time. Um, and it requires a, like very complex signal chains of many, many parallel signal paths going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. being f some being fed by the original guitar signal, others being fed by each other. Um, and lots of different things happening, each one having a kind of different component to the sound. And then sometimes they'll be, they will all, or some of them will feed into a, yet another one, which then changes everything that's fed into it. So you might have something where I'll create a signal chain that takes what I play and kind of extracts the lowest fundamental from that, even if I've created kind of a chord a sustaining mm -hmm. chord by playing, say, single notes in, it kind of sustains those notes together and creates a chord. It, but I found ways of actually kind of, in a sense, it's extracting the, the fundamental, as it, even as that chord kind of changes and moves, that fundamental will kind of move. And that, in a sense, gives me a bass note, which I can then process separately and bring in and out. Um, and then, you know, at different parts of the frequency spectrum, I'll, I'll kind of do different things. Um, 
and create different layers of a kind of orchestral texture in lots of different ways by moving things up, you know, an octave or two octave, but only part of the frequency spectrum, and then other parts I'll do something else to, and then recombine and and fragment, break apart, kind of pull apart and put back together again um, right. using granular techniques, which kind of take parts and kind of break them up and recombine them in. In, in, in a different order or a different time, a bit like a, a kind of delay, a, a much more kind of 21st century version of a delay in a sense, mm-hmm. um, which is much more flexible than that. Um, and then again, putting those through something to kind of smooth that out and then you know, it gets it goes on and on basically. And it becomes a bit like for me, um, almost composing in another way is creating these textures and, it, and, and using the different tools to Imagine what I, what, what I want to hear is something that sounds a bit like a, an orchestral, you know, top line of, of violins in the background or, or what I'd like to hear is something that sounds a bit like, you know, ice crystals, at the, you know, or that sounds like a very deep, whatever it might be. And then finding a way to kind of create that all from just single notes that I'm playing in on the guitar that then sustain to create a kind of a, a sustaining chord, which I then move, I pull those nodes in and out of the thing as, we, as it goes along, feed in new ones, pull out old ones, and so forth. Yeah, that, that was, again, something that we've never done before, and I thought that worked really, really well on this piece. Like, it kind of determined the direction of the whole piece, really. Did you want to play a second section of that piece? Yeah, there was a point in this piece which I thought was just interesting because despite the fact that the whole thing had this long sweeping kind of movement of the ocean and you doing all kinds of different things over that and all going on lots of different journeys, um, there was a point where everything just shifted gear and moved to a new place and I just really liked the way that happened and it just it just sort of happened with, with both of us at the same time, and so I'm just going to play from that part there. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I really liked that in a sense. You did that des- descending line and then I kind of echoed it. And then um, you kind of brought it in again, only even more powerfully. And then, the, then, then I got the whole soundscape to kind of sweep up under that as a kind of, because it just, I remember feeling this is, this is something, this is a change is happening here. And it was leading to that, and so I kind of thought, okay, let's sweep this into that. And then you took that and ran with it with a with a series of bass notes that, to me, are basically a, a harmonic progression because of what they do against the harmonic backdrop of the of the, of the electronics. Um, right. And that moves it into a kind of gives it that momentum of movement, and then you you carry on with variations on the motif. And I just I just really liked the way that whole thing um, moved and changed at that point. Yeah, me too. There's there was something that was happening in the background of your parts during that passage that was like a sort of an orchestral harmonic haze that was just sort of suspended in the air in the background that was just beautiful. I remember when we were tracking that, I, I just I just wanted to stop what I was doing and just sit back and listen to it. Really nicely done. Oh, thanks. So, um, now, the last piece we were going to listen to was... um... Loop Quantum. This piece almost didn't happen because it was raining a lot 
at one point. And in my old studio in Massachusetts, the, it was on the, the top floor. And if it was raining very hard, you could hear it in the, like on the ceiling, like you could hear the rain pounding the ceiling and you couldn't record anything. And that day it was, turned out to be a very rainy kind of New England gray day, which I usually like, but I was kind of distressed that we weren't going to be able to record anything. And then I just decided, well, let's make the rain a part of this piece and just keep going. So at the opening of this, you'll hear, you'll hear what it sounded like. You'll hear the rain hitting the windows and the roof on the studio. And then we begin playing. On this piece, I'm playing my 36 string double contra guitar, which is my favorite instrument. And it really took this piece in a different direction than the other pieces. And here's the opening of Loop Quantum. I like the momentum of this piece, which is coming from you, and I'm, I'm just kind of, from my perspective, I'm just kind of like adding in bits and pieces against, at this point in the piece anyway, against what you're doing, which is like propelling the whole rhythm and, and harmony of the piece. And I was kind of like, yeah, I feel like I was kind of punctuating that or, you know. And um, yeah, just mentioning that luckily, the actual rain, we included that because it, it came out in the recording, but we didn't actually use the microphones on this in the end. We didn't know that at the time. We didn't know we were going to, so we thought, oh, well, we've got some rain in the background. It's worth having the recording even if it has the rain. But in the end, we just ended up using the, the pickups from your guitar. Um, right. And so none of that actually got picked up. So we thought oh, we'll include it in there because it just, to me, it, it, it just encapsulated the, the mood of that, that, time in the in the session you know it was quite a long session all day long but at that point it just had a certain mood of the rain beating and i liked it and it had a, a very kind of new englandy kind of feel about it for some reason for me um and so yeah it was nice to include that yeah i agree i think it kind of set the set the stage for that whole piece and i really like what you're playing on it just that really raw distorted just searing kind of guitar tone that you get what, uh, do you want to talk about that a bit to say, you know, how you were getting there? Sure. I mean, interestingly, it's exactly the same tone that I use on on almost everything else, and I don't change it in the actual tone itself, um, the, the settings or anything like that. It's it's all down to just what I'm playing, really. Um, and so um, I only have 
three patches that I use really almost all the time. It's one of these three and they never really change. I, I have a, one or two others that I very, very occasionally use. Um, and this is what I think of as my sort of main lead patch um, that I never, I haven't changed the settings on it in many years. Um, but it, what I like about it is it really responds to what you do. So if you, you know, if you hit the strings harder, it gets more gutsy, you get, you get more distortion going on. Then if you hit them softly, it kind of, it cleans up um, a bit and... Like you would with an overdriven tube amp, for example. Yeah, I mean, it really responds very differently from that and it obviously sounds really different, different from that. But yeah, in that same kind of way. Um, but I think a lot of it also is just how I, how I phrase things, how I work with distortion. There, there is a fair amount of distortion on my signal most of the time, but you don't notice it so much unless I do certain things deliberately to kind of bring that out. Um, there are just a f ways of, of making that happen by how you play, how you phrase, how you set off the strings in a sense is what it is, is, you know, you, you agitate the string with the pick, but there's many other ways of agitating the strings. And, and once they're ringing, there's other ways of, of messing with that <laughs> once, it, once it's going. Um, and as people may or may not know, I use a sustainer on my guitar, so the notes will sustain indefinitely. And that's done using a, a, a magnetic thing. It's not like an electronic thing, basically. Um, the sound is fed into some electronics, which activate a, an electromagnet, which sits in place of one of the pickups on my guitar. It looks just like a pickup, but it isn't. And it basically does the reverse of what a pickup does. It takes that signal coming from the string and, and re-vibrates the string with, ma with a magnetic field with its own sound that is just made. And basically it works the same way feedback works with a guitar amp. Um, but it's done in a much more controllable way using magnetic field, but it's the same idea. And so it means you can get the, the, the notes to sustain as long as you hold them down, they will, they will ring. And it means that you can then really more like a saxophone or a, or, or a wind instrument, you can really, um, you can mess with what happens after you've agitated the string, because normally it would just die away. When you've got it sustaining like that, there's an awful lot that you can kind of do with it. Um, and the way distortion works uh, that I discovered decades ago is that it's, I see, if you get the right kind of distortion, it can be a bit like uh, surfing. I think of it as surfing, not that I know how to surf, I don't, but you can see how it works. And you basically, it, it's, if you surf the distortion with what you do, it, it, you can really change the tone. It's like a wave. And it's a wave that kind of crashes and then falls down. And if you ride the crest of it, you can make really interesting stuff happen with, with the tone. That's, that's one of many kind of ways I mess with the tone. But that is one of the things that you can do to kind of make it sound more raw, is to kind of ride the wave of how, it's decay how that distortion is accumulating and then decaying and push on that kind of envelope, as it were. So that's kind of partly what's going on. And it's partly how I agitate the string and how I manipulate the string once it's sustaining it. Yeah. Yeah. And those techniques are really on display on this track. So in this next section from Loop Quantum, uh, something entirely new occurs for us and for me. To give you a bit of background on the 36 string, it's a double neck instrument with 18 strings on each neck. The core tuning is an octave below guitar with an extra chorus tuned to A below that, so the, resp the um, frequency range of the instrument is lower than a bass, and then it has a high A and a high D course above the high E, which puts it more into guitar territory, so you have this massive range of registers that runs below a bass and well up into the guitar range. Uh, one neck is tuned in an intervallic tuning of my own device, and the other neck is tuned in octaves. The instrument's carbon fiber, making it incredibly responsive, much more so than a wood instrument. So there are techniques I can do on the carbon fiber instruments that just don't work 
on a wood instrument. And one of those is chordal tapping, where instead of using my right hand to attack a string, I'm using my right hand on the fingerboard and tapping the notes that I want. Something I had been working on before these recording sessions with Mark in 2018 was trying to tap counterpoint. So in other words, I would tap one thing on the left neck, which is in an altered tuning, and something else on the right neck in an octave tuning, more or less at the same time. So there, there are two lines moving simultaneously, sometimes more than two lines, sometimes a bass line on one neck and chords on the other neck. Um, and in the case of Loop Quantum, there were two fairly massive bass lines happening on both necks simultaneously. So I would play part of that line on the left neck and the next part of that line on the right neck. So the tuning would change. And I could also create things that I just wouldn't exist um, playing in a conventional way. In other words, using your right hand or a pick, uh, you just couldn't do this. So it'd be like a more, more like a piano where each hand is playing an independent part, creating at least two independent parts and in some cases three or four on this track. The pickup system on this is a K and K for those of you interested. There's a um, set of pickups on each neck such that at mix time, it's in stereo. So what you hear in the left channel is what I was playing on the left neck and what you hear in the right channel is what I was playing on the right neck. And that really comes into play on this piece. Uh, there's a lot of counterpoint that I'm producing and I think it really propels this piece into a new place for us. I think it just has a kind of energy that we may not have accessed previously on our other records. So um, yeah, that that's a, an amazing sound that you've created with that. Um, it's, I mean, that instrument, the way you've designed it and, and, and the way you play it has got a huge amount of power in the low end anyway. But with that tapping technique, it's just like huge amount of power. Um, make any electric guitar player jealous, I would say, however many amps they might have. Um, which is a lot of amps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it really does have, it's obviously got the percussive element to it, but because it's got all that low resonance right behind that percussive attack, it's, it's a very, like, powerful sound. And therefore, for me, it has, like, a real kind of, uh, yeah, deep kind of um, 
powerful momentum that it creates. And the stereo stuff that's going on there is just like, it's really amazing, I find it just, it really moves back and forth between the speakers in it. In it. You'd think that we were doing some kind of panning and mixing, but no, that's just naturally how the instrument sounds. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very stereo instrument, even acoustically, if you're standing in front of it, yet that's, that's exactly what it sounds like. And the um, tapping in the lower register, it has sort of this pipe organ-like resonance, but it's not muddy. It has a really clean and sharp articulation on the top side of, of each attack, which I think is just fantastic. I just really like the way it sounds. Yeah, and I find that something about those carbon instruments too, e even the low frequencies are really pure and, cl and, and they don't turn into a muddy kind of muffy kind of sound. They really hold their tone and overtones really nicely. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, and the sustain is just yeah, awesome. It is. So it's worth noting that Kevin designed these instruments um, and then had them built to his specifications. So the whole kind of concept of this sound is, is part of, um, of your whole way of, a, of almost composing in a sense, isn't it? It really has. Yeah, it really has taken over. Those were uh, built for me by Emerald Guitars in Ireland. If you want to look them up, it's emeraldguitars.com. And I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to Alistair Hay who was the um, owner and head luthier there, who built the 36 string, the 30 string, the 17 string, and the 15 string, which are my main instruments that I just use every day now. And I believe, I think I used all four of those on this record at some point, along with piano. And from my perspective on this track, I'm doing quite a bit of another kind of processing um, where the other thing I've always really liked to try to explore and, and, and to get to happen using the technology that's available now is to try to explore different textures for single note playing in the same way that um, a saxophone can change the tone a lot, even during a note or, yeah, between different notes. Um, I've always wanted to be able to do more of that on the guitar and so there's a, quite a bit of that going on in this and there. Again, it's techniques I've developed pretty recently where I'm using a whole, quite, again, quite complex signal chains um, to get those notes. And most of the sound I'm playing is my straight ahead normal guitar sound that I usually use. But you can hear on some of the notes you get these more, much more raspy kind of growly tones on certain notes and I'll fade that in with the pedal and that I'm actually fading in something from the laptop which is you know my signals going into the laptop as well as coming straight into the recording and um, so that is then feeding a bunch of um, processings that's creating those extra textures and in some cases I can change the texture in real time using controllers other pedals and atta an attachment on my guitar. It is really interesting. And I think also, just beyond all of that, what you're playing on this track is super intense and very musical. I just am so knocked out by what you played on that piece. Nicely done. Thanks. Well, I hope that um, you found this interesting um, as a bit of an insight into our thinking about how we approach this. Um, it was certainly kind of interesting for me anyway going back and, and listening to it and thinking about how we approached it. Um, so yeah, I, I hope this is, this is um, giving you some insight into kind of where we're at when we're making these things and how we're approaching it from an instrumental point of view and, and from our kind of our own kind of uh, way we develop our sounds as well as how we actually approach the sessions and the, the individual pieces. I agree. It was interesting for me to go back and look at some of the studio logs and notes and remember how we did some of these and um, our whole compositional approach. And I hope that listeners will find it insightful and helpful and maybe shed some light on the music and bring it into sort of another dimension if you have some of that understanding going on behind it. More information at markwingfield.com and kevincastning.com. Yeah, thanks. And 
I'm looking forward to our next collaboration, which has been had to be put on hold because of COVID. Um, we've not been able to get together as we hoped, but we're actually going to do something remotely, aren't we? Um, which I think is going to be just by its nature, it's going to be a different and interesting, I think. So. Right. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I think it'll be really solid. Good. Well, thanks for listening and um, bye from us for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.